So, David Nika, welcome to the High Impact Athletes Podcast. Thanks, dude. Thanks for having me. This is bloody cool, man. I um, I love what you guys do, uh, and I'm very, very proud to be uh, a small, small cog in the in the big wheel. Uh, it's great to have you on board, man. Um, so, look, you, you've spoken about this on a lot of other podcasts, but I love hearing origin stories. I find it super interesting, so let's go there anyway. Uh, you started boxing around the age of 14. And um, based on what I've heard, it was uh, back in the day, pick up the phone book, you saw the first combat gym there and, and decided to head around. And the thing that was really cool to me about that story was it seemed like your enthusiasm for boxing was so great that you sort of brought all of your family into boxing as well. Your brother started boxing, your father started boxing. Uh, what was it that hooked you so much about boxing early on? Uh, yeah, I um, I probably don't appreciate that as much as uh, as much as I should. The the fact that uh, you know, me starting a, a new sport, um, you know, I'm I'm the first uh, boxer in our family, so um, I think I think there, there there's like an addictive uh, nature to the sport of or to combat sports, I should say, just uh, and boxing specifically. I feel like once. Uh, you have kind of embedded yourself in a sport like boxing. It's really, really hard to get rid of it. And like my dad could testify to that. He's um he joined the 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 gym, the boxing gym, the same same day that I did. Uh, and he's he's just as hooked, if not more, than I am uh, to the sport. And uh, over time, uh, my brother showed uh, showed interest as well, just because. He was like, "Oh man, these guys are having so much fun. You know what's um what am I missing out on?" So he he got into it about six months after, and then when we started competing together, uh, obviously bringing our family along to the events was was huge, and they were like our you know day one supporters. So um, yeah, that was that's it's really kind of taken uh, a firm hold of uh, my family, but I like I. I I carry a lot of pride um in you know representing my family my family name uh and now now like my country um which is which is really really special. Yeah and and we were talking just before we started recording that your your brother was a seriously good boxer you said he he won an Oceania gold medal which is insane and that you were fighting on the New Zealand team together went to the Rio qualifying in China um Another thing that I heard on another podcast that I thought was a, an amazing story was how you got your last name. Do you mind just telling that story? Uh, it was the in Uganda, I think it was about the uh, the chieftain or something, yeah. something like that. Yeah, it's, it's it's like a funny story that I don't like completely understand. Um, but uh, when my when my granddad moved over or moved his family over from Uganda to New Zealand he had done his studies in New Zealand and then uh gone back to Uganda to uh practice as a dentist um there was a lot of uh there was a lot of political unrest at the time uh with the under the Idi Amin uh regime and so I think they were pretty keen to get out and uh he was saying um uh I was I was actually speaking to my auntie just just the other week and she was saying um she sat down with him one time and had a conversation and out of nowhere he just says um did you know that uh my name is actually um his name's Darius uh Aria so D- Darius Aria uh yeah. but it, the name the name that we know him by is uh Tom Nika Tom Nika and it's like I was like wait wait, wait okay where, where does where does Nika come from and um from my understanding uh he had a uh a chief of his tribe uh, his name was Koja Nika um I believe and he used to walk around the the village with a stool over his shoulder um whenever he would stop walking he would put a stool down and sit on it and my uh granddad from a very young age would follow him around uh, the village with his own little stool over his shoulder at a, at a young age, and whenever the chief stopped, he stopped, and they both sat down on their stools, <laughs> and that's that's kind of somehow that stuck when he came over to New Zealand. That's um, the the family name uh, that was adopted. So uh, we're we're essentially you know fir- first of our first of our name. Um, <laughs> I love that. Yeah, and it's there's so, there, there's so much mystery around um, kind of the the origins of. Uh, our family back in Uganda, but um, it's uh, yeah something I'd be really interested to to um, you know explore one day. Uh, I think there there will come a time 
where it will make sense and um yeah i'm excited i'm excited to explore that because um yeah like i said it's kind of like what it's like weird (laughs) like if if we went back would people know us or like uh like i'm i'm uh two generations passed on so i'm i'm one quarter ugandan but um uh there's there's a very distinct kind of uh nika trait that i don't quite um you can't you can't quite put your finger on but when i uh, go back to New Zealand and uh, reconnect with my uh, my Nika family. Um, everything makes a lot more sense. The way that why we are the way we are. Right, that's such a cool story. And this was actually a question for later. But mm. um, so you've never been to Uganda? Do do you have plans or desires to visit at some point? I'd I'd definitely like to go back. Um, I've I've got this pipe dream that I'd like to go to Uganda and. Uh, start a, a coffee plantation or a coffee farm um because i a i love coffee b uh i want to like reconnect with um uh uganda and my roots uh and i i also want to do some kind of like i also want to be able to give back so if i were to be able to do some conservation work while i were over there and maybe sponsor a sponsor a family to run the farm that's like a massive pipe dream. I don't even know where I'd, where I'd get started on that, but it's, it's making sense in my head. And I'm, uh, I'm thinking, uh, with time, it'll start to make more sense, uh, in my brain, whether or not that's something that is, uh, doable or yeah, like, awesome. Yeah. Awesome. I'd love to get in into that a little bit later mm. on. Um, but back to, back to early boxing days and mm. your family, just, is your dad still boxing? Oh, the old bastard! I keep trying to t- I keep trying to tell him to slow down. He's still trying to spar all the twenty year old dudes at the gym, and I'm like, uh, like the, the the he's had three corporate matches. Um, and the oh, last one he the last one he fought, he was fifty one. He was fighting a guy that was younger than me, uh, and it was a bloodbath. It was an absolute bloodbath. I was like, oh, dad! <laughs> I was like, we're gonna we're gonna have to do something about. Well, you're gonna have to like um pack it in but he's um he's so hooked on it and it's it's been really really good for me he's um had uh his fair share of uh struggles with um you know substance abuse alcohol um which has uh which obviously was like difficult but um boxing is something that has really helped him through a hard time um so uh, yeah i think i think there's there's some, a lot of magic in the sport yeah i can I can sort of imagine how something like boxing would be more powerful than a lot of other sports to deal with things like addiction or, or like with struggles that you have going on in your life. I don't know quite why that is. Is it is it because you just have to, especially when you're sparring, you have to have such intense focus on the moment because you literally could get punched in the face if you sort of get distracted? Is What, what do you think it is about boxing that makes it so good for, for people who are struggling with things? Uh, I, I honestly think it's, um, it comes down to the primal nature of the sport. Um, I was, I was actually just saying to Lexi, my partner last night, um, I feel like living a healthy lifestyle comes down to two things. It's, uh, what you eat and how you eat it or like, um, what you eat and what you do in order to eat that food. So, uh, let's go let's go back to caveman as you're a caveman uh you have to catch your food to eat it and what are you catching you're catching wild game uh you're you're cooking it with no no chemicals no nothing you're working extremely hard to um to you know to to feed yourself nowadays people can sit down in a on an office chair like like we are right now for eight to ten hours a day and they eat absolute garbage Um, now when you've got a sport like boxing, um, you're challenged every second and every minute, every hour of the time you spend, uh, boxing, you're, um, it's, it's violent, it's primal, it's exhausting. Uh, I feel like there's something very innately, um, uh, beneficial to our, our biochemistry to, to actually feel, happy and to feel good and and like i think 
there are so many ways to kind of bypass that nowadays and kind of take shortcuts towards to, to feel good. So people use alcohol, people use all kinds of other drugs, people uh, use fast food, you know, to, to make themselves feel better. Um, but that is very, very temporary. So I feel like a sport like boxing, you've got, uh, uh, if you've got a, a challenge in front of you uh, and whether or not you overcome it, you've still tried and you've still exerted yourself and exhaust just exhausted yourself to to try and make ends meet so mm. i i think i think there's something there's something that is uh it's it's just challenging yourself challenging yourself to to uh reach your goal is what makes it so addictive uh because it gives you it gives you that release and that kind of um for men you get testosterone uh you, you know you feel you feel alive you know there's, there's nothing quite like it getting punched in the face i, I recommend it for, <laughs> i recommend it for everyone everyone should get punched in the face at least a handful of times well i can i can actually say i have been punched in the face good man not proud not proud of you man <laughs> so proud of you i mean i do have an older brother so that probably contributes yep. to it but this yep. this the worst time wasn't of my own choosing but it's to all be, the same man it's all the same. To be completely honest, I wouldn't. I wouldn't choose to do it again. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I can. I can sort of. I think I understand what you're getting at there. Where, especially, if you're doing something like boxing and you need to be extremely focused to avoid getting hurt, then you will notice if you've eaten crap or if you've you haven't you know lived your best lifestyle outside of the ring and it'll translate in there and you'll get hurt because of it so it's sort of yeah. this self-perpetuating loop of you know having to eat better so that you survive mm. type thing yeah yeah well why would you why would you put yourself in harm's way why would you uh, eat all this crap if you knew that next week you were gonna have to get beaten up again you know and it's yeah. like oh well i'm gonna make sure you know i like prepare myself better this time to to not get my ass kicked and i, I feel like um uh most most fighters most boxers uh are very humble because they've uh they've eaten a few knuckle sandwiches along the way you know like everyone's everyone's been humbled by by the sport and um we're very happy uh well tempered people because of it you know right yeah that's that's super interesting one mm. one thing that we were talking about before we started recording was uh your brother and um and your upcoming family reunion around a around a half marathon that you're mm. going to do but um the thing that was fascinating to me was you, you mentioned that your brother's obviously a, a fantastic boxer but you said that he he comes at boxing from a very different angle than you do but you feel like you're sort of coming closer over time do you mind just sort of explaining that yeah yeah um so obviously like you said before you have brothers uh you grew up competing against your brothers uh and for me i was always uh, I, i'm the younger brother by four years and so there's there's a big enough age gap that uh we were um we were separate but i was always trying to chase him i was always trying to catch him uh if we were if we were running down the road i'd be running behind him trying to chase him and he'd be in front looking behind to see how close i am behind and he'd be he'd be running away so um the way i put this together in my head um i call it my dave logic but he's always had uh a f like a flight mentality he's always tried to uh he's always been um uh probably more risk averse than i than i am um and that uh that has worked to his advantage um over the years just like uh my chase's mentality has has worked to my advantage so I've always wanted to chase him with, if we're running, if, uh, if we're fighting, I always want to beat him. Um, if we're, it doesn't matter what we're doing. If, if we're eating at the dinner table, I'm going to eat more than him, you know? Um, and sure enough, like, uh, fast forward and I'm, I'm, I think I'm like a good 20 kilos heavier than him now. He, <laughs> he, he might've put on some, some dad weight, but, um, I've, I've like, I've surpassed him. I'm like, uh, um, maybe six inches taller than him as well, but, um, he in the ring was always very risk averse and very very fit very strong uh he didn't have uh like any physical weaknesses um his kind of his mentality in the ring was that he's going to make sure he doesn't get hit uh by any means necessary and so he kind of had a very defensive approach towards fighting um and would would be very meticulous the way he the way he trained he would be uh he would 
uh, he would obsess over small details that would just drive me nuts. I'd, I'd watch him and be like, just do it. Like, just, just like, what do you, like, he'd, uh, he'd get stuck on, uh, very small things. And meanwhile, I'm, I've got this kind of undiagnosed ADD where I'll kind of, if something doesn't work, I'll be like, oh, okay, I'm going to drop that and try something else. Um, and if, if, if something doesn't work right away, I'll take another approach or I'll find another, another route to get to where I need to be. Um, and that, that, that really showed in the ring, um, our kind of differences. He was just more of a, um, uh, he would jab and move, jab and move, jab and move very, very quick, very fit, very physically strong. Um, and he was the kind of guy that if someone uh, like, if they met in the middle, someone was getting knocked out cause he was that, he was that strong. It was, uh, it was like him or the other guy, uh, because he was so tense and so, um, kind of wound up. Whereas I've always been a lot more kind of relaxed and fluent and, um, uh, kind of a little bit blase at times maybe. Um, but it's just interesting kind of like, uh, exchanging notes on, uh, on boxing with him because we just were so far apart in terms of the way we, the way we approach the sport. And do you feel like you're getting more meticulous over time? Uh, maybe not more meticulous, but I'm becoming a little bit OCD. Uh, I'm a, a little bit more pedantic about, um, maybe not pedantic but i've 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 had to learn how to uh operate myself or, or like almost train myself i was um in the build up to the olympics in tokyo um i trained uh primarily alone by myself for about 3 years, like 3 years sorry my voice is still breaking um <laughs> i i trained myself for about 3 or 4 years uh which was really challenging but i it was um it was it was what was necessary i had to like i didn't want to pick up any uh, a new coach to kind of teach me a completely new way to box because i knew how to box i just had to um kind of hone my own craft and like my, what i knew i did well and so i i became a little bit um more like uh wound up about you know things just have have to be just right if i'm going to train um, mm. or if I'm going to get the most out of my training and it wasn't fun. Um, like I, I didn't enjoy the build up to, to the Olympics because I was, uh, suffering as, as so many others were with, um, you know, throughout the COVID lockdown and whatnot, but, um, it really, it, it really did take, take quite a bit out of me. So, um, it was, uh, yeah, it was, it was, it was really challenging, but I feel like I've grown from it and now I can kind of take those learnings, uh, and, keep trying to evolve uh with with a new coach with Noel Thornbury as my as my coach and manager so um it's a it's a it was a difficult step but I feel like it's it's really helping me uh down the line is it is it really abnormal I assume it's really abnormal for a boxer of your caliber to go that long without a coach overseeing things yeah, I, I like I wouldn't recommend it. I didn't uh like I said I didn't enjoy it because I was solely accountable for uh not only um you know uh the training I did but actually putting the sessions together and kind of compiling um a workload that is uh sufficient to becoming uh an Olympic medalist which ultimately I achieved but um it at, 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 it was at quite a big cost uh, on my mental well being. Um, and was it because there wasn't anyone that you felt that you could trust enough to take you where you were and just enhance that? Pretty much, pretty much. Um, I had, I had the, I had enough influence around me that uh, I knew I was moving in the right direction. I have uh, Cairo George. I trained out of his gym at Hit Fitness HQ in Hamilton. Uh, I had my strength and conditioning coach, uh, Sean Patterson, uh, who was uh, working at the Advantage Dome at the time. So he was kind of my confidant. I, I leaned on him a lot uh, over that period um, because he was the only, he was my staple um, ingredient to being the, the fittest and the strongest athlete I could be at the Olympics. Um, and yeah, I've, I've, I'm still working with him today. Um, nice. Uh, yeah, I, I, bump, I bumped into him at the Bellodrome uh, a few weeks ago. Seemed like a really good dude. Yeah, oh, dude, he's he's one of the nicest guys you'll ever meet. Um, that the world needs more of them. They need they need more more Sean's, less villains. <laughs> so okay, so 
you started boxing your whole family started boxing you all got really into it you obviously showed immense talent early on uh but you know from 14 to the age of 18 very short amount of time you go to the commonwealth games in 2014 in the light heavy division as an 18 year old you won gold in that first com games and i've heard you speaking about how you felt such a lack of expectation in those early rounds that you felt like you could be really free. And I, I completely mm. understand that, you know, being an underdog is such a, such a gift a lot of the time. Mm. But then at some point you graduate out of that. Like you have proven yourself enough that you can't, you can't go on thinking of yourself as the underdog. And I, I just wondered in the title fight at the first com games, was that already starting to happen? Did you start having more expectations of yourself to win that? that title fight were there were there extra nerves because of that do you remember that far back and the the sort of mind state that you were in um i yeah i like that's something that i'll always uh struggle with i think being the being the the top dog being the um the favorite to win um i i much prefer being an underdog and so whatever it takes for me to feel like the underdog um i'll kind of shift my mind that way because uh like like i said just before like i've always i've always been chasing my brother i've always wanted to uh to chase something to to have uh you know a a bigger goal in mind and uh, you know my ultimate um goal now is to become a cruiserweight world champion uh that's that's my next milestone um and that's that's it's not easy it's and it the sport is a lot more different than i thought it would be uh in comparison to amateur boxing it's it's a lot more of a, a dog fight um but th- those those expectations uh i i do feel it i do feel it and i don't necessarily like it um i don't like being it's it, it probably sound sounds kind of um weird but i don't necessarily like being the center of attention i like uh coming in um coming in the back, back door and surprising everybody being like hey I'm the next big thing, you know, I don't want, I don't want people to be like, Oh, Dave is going to be the next big thing. I like, I know I'm going to be the next big thing, but I'd much rather, uh, take the world by storm, um, than kind of have these expectations because, uh, the more you start to believe in your own hype, uh, the more it starts to kind of shape you and, uh, you know, maybe change the way you, you approach, uh, your sport or you know your your talent you might uh, take it for granted um, and I I've been I've been guilty of that in the past and I don't don't want to do that again yeah I, I really get that I mean the the thing I find the most impressive about people who manage to remain at the top for a long period of time so I the only thing I can speak about with any real authority is tennis and mm. the top three guys Federer Nadal Djokovic the thing that I find freakish about those three guys is the amount that they've been able to win when they've been at the top and Mm. every single time they step on a tennis court they have the biggest bullseye on their back and Mm. every person that they play it's their chance to make history in their own life right like whenever anyone plays against those guys it's their chance to say i beat roger or i beat rafa yep. or whatever yeah and they just somehow manage to to stay in a mental state that lets them win and win and win week in week out year in year out it's it's i don't understand it i don't it's, understand that mental it, resilience it's impressive because uh they know they have a target on their back and they know yep. that everybody's studying how to beat them so if if, you, if you're um if you're a federer if you're a nadal if you're djokovic um people are studying how you operate and not only that, but they're trying to figure out how to beat you as well. Yeah. Um, which, yeah, like, like you said, is just a freakish talent. Um, how do like how do you kind of respond to that? How how is that? How does that kind of theme fit into your mindset? Because obviously, obviously, you're at a very you're at a world class level. Obviously, you've been out for a little while, but uh, you know, having having nothing to lose against those guys, do you feel like that kind of um, fuels your fire or is it is it daunting is it like oh bloody hell like all right everyone's gonna see me get my ass kicked against uh Djokovic and um you know like you're already you're already uh a step behind almost is that how do you feel it's it's both sides so I'm I'm very much like you in that 
I prefer to be the underdog because I think my biggest mental challenge over my career has always been feeling like an imposter. You know, Mm. like I'm, I'm just a kid from a farm and whited up a, like what, how do I belong at Wimbledon sort of thing. But then, you know, you, you win enough matches, you, you play enough of the top guys to start feeling comfortable. And then the next step in my mind is if you get into a winning position against the very top in the world, it's trying not to let the doubts creep in when you're very, very close to winning. Mm. And that's so incredibly difficult. In, and yeah. in something like tennis where you can't run the clock out, like you have to beat <laughs> yeah. people yeah. and the doubts start creeping in. And as soon as you get into future mind, that's, that's a recipe for disaster. Like yeah. as soon as you start thinking in the future, thinking, oh my God, my mum's going to be so stoked. That How I am I going to celebrate? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then the wheels can really start falling uh. off. So you know, I, I think tennis is, is very different to boxing in this way in that we play tournaments, you know, 25 to 35 times a year. Mm. So we have so many opportunities to be in those moments and to learn about ourselves and how to, how to deal with those moments. Whereas, mm. you know, with boxing, you guys fight so few times that you've really, I imagine anyway, you've really got to juice as much learning out of each individual experience as you can Mm. because because you don't get as many of them so yeah for me it was just a process of like my coach calls it locker room power um and he's actually he's written a book about it which i Mm. i recommend Mm. it's that it is that when when you're the big dog and someone who's lesser ranked than you gets into a winning situation locker room power is the little creeping doubt doubts that enter people's minds thinking should i actually be beating this person or not and that's the those little pressure moments, those little sort of inflection mm-hmm. points that if you're the big dog, you can push on and just be like, well, you know, do you actually want to beat me here? Like, do you actually feel like you're ready mm-hmm. to beat me here? Mm-hmm. And then, you know, there's so many levels that you can go down to mentally in, in any sport. And that's where I find it gets really interesting, This these subtle mental dynamics between mm-hmm. opponents. So they're, they're inevitable as well. That Like, wherever you go, whatever sport you uh, you find yourself in, those those doubts are always going to creep in. I don't care who you are. Yeah. Um, that kind of uh, mental fortitude doesn't come without uh, like time pressure. Um, failure. Failure. Yeah. Uh, like you need to be under the pump all the time. And so, like you saying, you compete twenty five to thirty times a year that's like that's a lot of pressure and that's like um a lot of time on your body as well i feel sorry for your poor bloody ankles like um that <laughs> it looks gnarly man but uh like uh people say the same for for boxes you know like um right now i'm starting to learn about the power of uh activity in the boxing ring because um being in the ring under the lights in front of crowds is super important um because uh, especially early on in a professional career you're not going to pick up any kind of momentum by fighting two times a year. You need to be in the ring four, five, six times a year, like every couple months, so that you can keep the iron, uh, the iron hot and the, um, you know, the dagger sharp. You want to make sure that uh, you've got uh, the the clarity when you're in the ring. You want to feel like you've got, um, I guess, just the uh, the time and experience of the ring. And I, I, I would worry 25 to 30 times a year, whether or not that would be, uh, you'd burn out from that. Did have you ever kind of experienced that? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Mm. Um, you know, talking, talking about struggling during COVID tennis, the tennis tour during COVID was sort of like a traveling prison. Like, we, oh. we, like we couldn't, we went to the airport. We, we like flew to a place straight from the airport to the hotel, get something shoved up your nose, go into quarantine yeah. until you get the result back, which yeah. was anywhere between 24 to sort of 48 hours. And then you could only go between the hotel and the tennis court. So Uber Eats every night, no one around. And it, it was just that week after week after week. And actually... Um, I think I lost you there, bro. Oh, it's all good. I, think lost, it, it, I lost it, you for about 10, 15 seconds. I think so the cool thing about Riverside is that it keeps recording cool. on your computer and on my computer so at the end it should it should oh, upload sweet. perfectly cool what'd you say <laughs> <laughs> we're I, was, I was saying like yeah so we'd we'd 
you know, like we'd, we'd arrive at a place, mm. stick it's up the smart. nose, quarantine, and then we'd be, we couldn't leave the hotel and tennis courts. And so it would be Uber Eats every night, no one around, and that was life for like a year. And oh, actually, I, I didn't, I didn't really click with this in my head until long after. Actually, it was, it was on the Between Two Beers podcast that I f- first spoke about this. I was in a really dark place before Tokyo. Like, yep. the, the, the month before Tokyo, during the grass court season, which is my favorite time of the year. I, I love playing mm. on grass. Um, and I was miserable. Mm. And my wife, she was, um, I think she was my fiance at the time. Mm. Uh, she'll kill me if I got that wrong, but she, <laughs> she was either my wife or my, my fiance. Um, but yeah, she was really worried about me. And actually I decided before Tokyo to, I went to her parents' place, which is in sort of rural Connecticut. Mm. I put my tennis bag in the back of the closet and didn't look at it for a week. Cause I knew that I was just in the worst possible headspace mm. to go into an Olympics. And I'm so glad that I did that. And I'm so glad for the support team that New Zealand had at the Olympics. Cause mm. guy, Jason McKenzie, um, Mm. early on i just said hey look look mate i've been really struggling and i i desperately want to do well here so mm. can we chat about it and and can you help me out if, if it's at all possible and you know i was pretty open pretty open with him about it i didn't want to speak too much about it to mike mike venus the the guy i was playing doubles with yeah, there because yeah. i didn't want to put too many doubts in his head yeah. you know i just wanted to try and deal with it but mm. well, i mean actually possibly the biggest reason that I was just a complete emotional wreck after we won the medal there was because I felt so such intense relief that Mm. I didn't have to hold this darkness inside me anymore Mm. like this thing that I was pushing Mm. down Mm. um so yeah that's (laughs) I don't know that's probably getting a little too deep into it but yeah it's like a no it's a real struggle 100 percent, and that's like um because uh, I I feel like I was going through a similar thing in the build up, and I remember I even documented some of it. I just um, talked talked to camera, and I was I was um, doing the math in my head, and I was like, uh, I live a healthy lifestyle. I'm I've got a good supportive family, supportive friends. Um, you know, I've got my dog. I'm like, there's no reason uh, right now why I shouldn't feel happy and fulfilled. Um, and I had this like, yeah, that this this uh, kind of overwhelming sense that uh, something wasn't right. But I I didn't address. I I wasn't necessarily addressing it. I was like, this is, um, it, it's a. I I was like, this is irrational. I'm I'm being irrational. I, I shouldn't. I don't deserve to feel uh, unhappy or like, um, you know, like I like I haven't got uh, one of the best lives. Uh, one of the best lives on earth, you know, I live the best life. I'm so happy. I've got everything I need to be happy, but I'm not, <laughs> you know, and it's yeah, like, yeah. it's confronting because it's like, um, you know, what's wrong with you? What, like, what's your problem? And I, um, I, I learned quite a lot over that period and I, um, uh, I've kind of kept, um, I've kind of kept something in my back pocket, um, from that experience. And I've, I've always, uh, I've always been like uh, forthcoming with my, uh, say, let's say vulnerabilities or my feelings or like, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, uh, cooped away. Like, um, I feel like a lot of young men are, I'm, I don't, I don't tuck my feelings in a ball and like hide them somewhere, stuff them under the bed. But I, um, what I, what I realized was that the more I talked about my vulnerabilities, the more I kind of fed into them, I fed them a little bit. And so the more I, I felt like I, uh, open like open the 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 outlet the more uh the more positive sympathetic um you know uh the the more kind of like positive sympathetic energy i i i absorbed but the 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 sympathy was it doesn't help it doesn't help like um talking talking to people was important uh but i chose um like I, I learned from that that speaking from a position of power, speaking through uh, through experience and um, success, is is really really important. You know, you don't want to let in all the all the good and bad vibes. You want to be able to turn the tap on and off, on and mm. off. So for for me, I found 
the more I talked about it, the more I started feeding into it and the more I relied on other people's sympathy to feel better. Um, and I started... That's an interesting be- balance, eh? Yeah, I started to feel like a, like a bit of a victim of my own demise. I was like, wait, hold on a second. Like, um, we've still got a big fucking task to, to overcome. I've still got to qualify for the Olympics. Um, I've still got so much more work to do. And I, I, I've, I found that after that experience... Um, because I, I, I had the strange, I had the stranger sensations. I was like, um, I started seeing sadness in other people, and I was like, I've never seen that before in my life. I've never, like, I've never seen someone walking and been like, oh man, like I've, like just, I could see, I could see the weight people were carrying around. And I was like, this is just so odd. But that's depression. I'm <laughs> like, I learned later yeah. on. I was like, oh, I was really unhappy. Do um, you feel like you were seeing clearly, or do you feel like you were coloring things through your own? No, I was seeing so clearly. I was seeing so clearly. I was um seeing almost too clearly. I I I started um I started I'd I'd come out the shower and I'd sit down um on the couch and I'd be like, "Man, I stink." I'd I I started like kind of um uh recognizing all of the the all of the bad things, which is probably which is probably uh it's it's not a it's not a good thing or a bad thing it's just there it's just it's just so it's just yeah. uh all of a sudden you've got um this vision that i didn't ha- i never had before because i hadn't had any kind of mental health struggles in the past so i was like what the f- like what's going on here um but have you i ever dived into stoicism no no i haven't no i i, I will look into that oh well, it's just t- something you said just it. before is such a core idea of stoicism which is mm. like things are neither good nor bad mm. it's our thinking that makes them so mm. you know like any situation that happens to us society could label it good or bad other mm. people can label it good or bad but how it affects us a lot of the time is our decision you know even if, mm. it's, if it's a bad thing if we can say ah oh, well this this is an incredible learning opportunity or this is an incredible opportunity to get better at xyz mm. mm. and i I feel like it fits in with the athlete lifestyle so well because we've constantly 100%. dealt failures or or trials, right? And just yep. being able to reframe yep. in a, not necessarily a positive way, but just in like a, okay, this is happening. Yep. How are we going to deal with this? How, yep. what, what's the best path yep. forward for me right now? Yep. And there, and you're always, you're always under the limelight. You're always like, you're, you're literally there to be observed. Uh, so, yep. so all of your flaws are, um, are aired out in front of a crowd. You know, if you get knocked out in front of 10,000 people, everybody saw your legs go limp and your eyes roll to the back of your head. You know, that's, it's not, yeah. it's not, uh, pretty, but, uh, that shit happens, man. And, um, it's a, it's a really, really hard thing for people that don't, um, that don't compete to, to kind of understand and maybe, um, uh, you know it's that's probably a really really scary thing to a lot of people but uh as athletes we we put ourselves in harm's way uh in order to be the best versions of ourselves and we like it's um it doesn't always work out um yeah but that's it's part of the game man that's why we do it it's um yeah. it's very it's very that's why it's compelling as well right oh 100 like, yeah. that's why people watch sport because the yeah. human condition is laid open yeah. for everyone to see in all of its beauty and all of its darkness yeah, and like yeah. tragic yeah it's great it's kind of goes back to what i was saying before about like um you know uh what you eat and how you eat it you have to we have to fight for for our food every day if we if you're not in the boxing ring you could be on the tennis court you're still fighting to to be the best version of yourself and to uh to overcome uh ginormous obstacles like beating a Beating a Nadal, beating a Federer, come on, man, who does that? Who does that? But Very that's the thing. Few. Very yeah, few people yeah, do that. Yeah. They they beat each other all the time, you know. Someone's <laughs> got to do it. Someone's got to do it. Why why couldn't it be us? Um, yeah, yeah. I, f- I find it very inspiring, and yeah, I I don't ever want to lose that kind of mentality that uh, I am the underdog and I've got so much left to prove. Because as soon as you as soon as you stop trying to uh, prove prove uh, prove a point to yourself. Uh, you'll stop trying to prove it to. I uh, know as soon as you stop trying to prove prove uh, a point to someone else and yourself, 
the sooner you start kind of realizing, oh, there's no point of this, you know? Just coasting, like, right? You just start coasting, yeah. Yeah, yeah. We've, we've always got, we need to keep evolving. It doesn't matter where yeah. we are, who we are, we need to keep evolving. Totally agree with that. And this, uh, it, this is actually a nice, um, a nice seg into, mm. I, I really want to talk about the Olympics because um, that's where we met. Yeah. And actually, bit of, bit of context. So yeah, we got, we got put in the same apartment in Tokyo and when um, when we were first first met and saying hello and stuff, he's like, oh, I'm "Dave, I, we're, I'm boxing. Uh, uh, Mike and Marcus, we're playing tennis." And Dave was like, "Oh, you guys are tennis players. I thought your calf muscles would be bigger." <laughs> and that I did. That was <laughs> confronting. That cut deep, man. And came I don't in know how many. Heavy. <laughs> don't know how many calf raises I've done, but nothing's changed. So I'm just gonna have to have to live with it, I guess. You're gonna but, have to um, ask. You're gonna have to ask like Federer or Nadal or Djokovic. There's a fucking stack. Uh, built different, those yeah. guys. <laughs> um, but yeah, so you, you you've spoken publicly about the struggle of missing out on Rio and the learnings you you took from it. But then five years later, you walk into the Olympic Stadium in Tokyo, holding the New Zealand flag alongside Sarah, Sarah Hedini. And wearing Te Mahutonga, the, the traditional cloak for Kiwi flag bearers. I was in the group walking out behind you and I was emotionally overwhelmed. And I, I just can't even imagine what it would have been like for you. And I guess the question is just like, what can you explain what it meant and how it felt to be walking out into that stadium holding that flag? Um, uh, not really. The, holding, the, holding the flag and... Um you know, walking out in front of uh, what was actually an empty stadium, it didn't mean as much as the um, the feeling of uh, acceptance and belonging uh, to you know the New Zealand team, um, because I like I've I've always had like a like a mild identity crisis where I like um, everybody looks at me and thinks I'm Maori. Uh, I've, I've I've never been Māori. I've never, um, I've never felt Māori. I've never, um, uh, but I've always been accepted. I've always been accepted by by the Māori community. Um, but then, meanwhile, I, I've grown up in New Zealand. I'm I'm as Kiwi as they come. Uh, I I as I essentially identify as a white person. I've I've grown up with, um, uh, you know, in a small country school. Um, I've, I but then but then there there was some kind of strange kind of attachment where, uh, I felt like I wasn't um, I felt I felt kind of judged at at times, um, because of the way I look, uh, and that that kind of that kind of crunched me a little bit because I'm like well like I'm I'm so Kiwi I'm so Kiwi, um, but I don't belong to the Maori community and I'm not necessarily accepted into the, uh, the, the vast majority, which is white. Um, mm. and so when, when Rob Waddell came, uh, and asked me, I would like, I, I felt like, um, like I, I didn't deserve it any more than anybody else to, to, you know, carry the flag. Uh, like if, if, if you, if, if you were asked, I would have had, you know, obviously if you walked the, the I didn't have two Commonwealth go- Games golds to my oh, but yeah, <laughs> maybe, but that, that's like, it's, it, it seems so irrelevant to me. It was just, it was just the feeling that, um, it was like a symbol of, okay, you are one of us. And I was like, oh man, I was like, man, I wish I'd like, I wish I felt like that all the time, you know? Um, Amazing. Any waterworks? Oh dude, I cried more in that week then I've cried my entire life that's awesome I cry I've never cried that much I was like and then I needed to oh <laughs> stop the waterworks and I had to get in and fight some uh, big scary man um, <laughs> but it was it was insane man it was it was really really special and I um, I've never felt so accepted and I've never felt that feeling of belonging like a did and I think I've always kind of strived for that I've always wanted to like I said I wanted to impress my brother and in order to impress my brother I had to catch him uh, or I had to I had to uh, wrestle as friends to 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 show that I was strong you know I'd, I'd like try um that like would play jujitsu with his friends and I'd be trying to get his mates in like headlocks and uh just stuff like that I was always trying to trying to be accepted by those that I care about uh and the feeling that I could achieve that 
at the Olympics uh, for my country was like uh, very, very overwhelming. Yeah. That's beautiful. Mm. And then fast forward a couple of weeks and you've got a bronze medal in your hands. It's neat, man. Yeah, it's it the wrong color of gold, but uh, I get, yeah, you got to... I, 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 I settled, I settled. Yeah, you feel me, you get me. <laughs> but um, no, it was... Uh, that was that was a really, really challenging couple of weeks. I spent uh, the majority of it uh, in the the rehab center, actually. I, I feel like I pro- we probably crossed paths a few times in there, but... In the ice bath. Um, yeah, in the ice bath and whatnot, but um, no, I, I snapped a, a ligament in my elbow two weeks before I went to the um, to the Olympics, oh, um, inspiring, yeah, and so I was, I was in a lot of pain, I was in a lot of pain, I, um, uh, I think, I think it wasn't completely ruptured, but it almost made it worse, it was a, a, a ligament somewhere in here that essentially i couldn't throw any left hooks because um i was worried that my arm was gonna like fall off oh, man. <laughs> but yeah it was um it was yeah that was that was real tough but it was just another um uh, it it almost freed me a little bit because i was like ah oh, you know like i can't the expectation I, thing the again, expectation huh? thing's gone yeah i was like, the I'm underdog like, yeah i became the underdog in my own mind and so i was like oh this well this this works actually this works for me and i was like I can't, um, I, it's, it sounds bad, but I already had an excuse. I already had an excuse for, you know, why I didn't achieve, uh, like my goals. But at the same time I was free. I was like, Oh, Oh, like there's, there's, um, there's no pressure on myself because I knew I was already, I was already, um, uh, kind of like, uh, I'm not sure what the PC word for handicapped is now is. But like I like I, I felt yeah I don't know but like I felt like I um, you had a was, disadvantage that I, you were I was disadvantaged with and, yeah. yeah and it was um it was like really challenging because uh, that's well, it was challenging but like, it's, it's fighting that's fighting we're always challenged that's like if if I go into a fight and I don't have a niggle any niggle uh, all of a sudden I'm like oh, okay what's what's like where's the catch where's the catch it's weird eh? I I, lo- like, I, I love probably count on my fingers the amount of times in my professional career i've gone onto a tennis court and not have something i yeah, need to manage that's it man and it's, that's it but you can use those like, like like case in point this this made me feel free i was like oh, okay it's like you know what's the uh what's the worst get that could happen um nothing to lose nothing to lose yeah exactly yeah. that's that's a it's a dangerous place to be you know mm. for your opponent like 100 mm, percent. and it's yeah again like putting my tennis mm. lens on it again like the sometimes the most dangerous opponents are if you're really smashing someone and you're getting close mm. to the finish line they're just like yeah. well i've lost this match so i'm just gonna like you know six or they sticks. go relaxed and yeah, yeah and man. and you you i'm i assume this is the same in fighting in tennis you play by far your best tennis when you're relaxed like yeah yeah you hit harder you breathe easier yeah. like everything's loose yeah, and then you're then you're dangerous. I've heard there are actually a lot of a lot of similarities between the two sports, um, which probably sounds so daft to someone that doesn't hasn't played either. But um, the uh, kinetic just, chains are very similar. The kinetic chains are very similar. Um, the way you move the uh, the kind of yeah yeah I think that's a, that's a great way to put it. The kinetic chains we we all kind of rely on um, you know our feet and our hands working yeah. together. You know. Yeah. yeah, and I mean, not to the same degree, I don't think, but there's also that same adversarial nature where oh yeah, you know, you're 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 like fighting directly against each other. I think yeah. there are there are a lot of sports where you do your job as well as you can, and you try and beat the other people doing their jobs as well as they can. But it's mm. not take like winner and loser take each other down until there's one left, sort of thing. Yeah, it's not as it's not as head on. Yeah, but, um, yeah. So. One one thing that I think you strike a really good balance with is the mix of self confidence, self belief, and humility. Because you come across as extremely confident in your abilities as a boxer and as an athlete, and and as a human, I think. But you come across as humble at the same time in a lot of ways. What was this? Was this a conscious decision? Like, do, do you think a lot about this? Or was this sort of a natural state for you? And, and has this developed over time at all or changed? Um, I've never... Uh, 
I've never been a confrontational person. I didn't start boxing because uh, I wanted to be tougher than someone else or to seem tougher than someone else. It was kind of a byproduct of me wanting to um, pursue a different sport. Like I, I'd done a lot of running, a lot of rugby, uh, started playing football, and then um, and then I was like, oh, like why have I never even thought to to box or to do a combat sport? And my dad, as soon as I kind of expressed that I might be interested, he's always been a like a, a boxing fanatic, but he never got the chance when he was a kid to to you know start boxing. So he he leaned right into it, and I was like, oh sweet, I've got dad's support. And then uh, mum followed like uh, hesitantly behind, but I, I got her on board. Um, but this the kind of um that kind of uh, confidence came with. Um, Hmm. It, it's a it's a it's a tricky one because I've you know I've I've never been in a street fight I've never been in an altercation outside of the ring. Um, it's not a matter of trying to prove anything to anybody else. It's more just trying to prove to myself that uh, that I can be uh, a better version. And and the day I stop trying to prove to myself um, how good I can be is the day that I should retire. Um, I like I I have so much left to prove and I've so I have so much untapped potential that I um I'd be doing a disservice to myself to give up um and that that is essentially what drives me I don't I don't my my motivations change every week you know I like the only thing I can rely on is good music and strong coffee you know um because they they get me out of bed every day uh and I know that I have um bigger dreams that uh that will follow after boxing but this this is a a a means to get me to where i need to be uh down the line you know i i want to i want to do so much more with my life than just uh smash noggins so it's like this is (laughs) this is um purely a vehicle uh that i am actually the the byproducts of me of me boxing are so beneficial to my soul to my character to the people around me i'm a better person because I am a world class athlete. Um I don't think I would be as good a person if I weren't an athlete. Um and if I didn't take as much pride in uh the way I carry myself and the way I uh present myself in front of the people that support me, you know, that that's my family, that's that's New Zealand, that's um, you know, this small country town of Gatton now. Um, you know, I I'm very proud of the people that follow me and i i want to i want to i want to impress them i want to keep impressing and i i yeah i i don't i don't um i don't look forward to the day where i become uh the the household favorite i that's not i'm always trying to impress i don't want to i don't want to ever be comfortable or feel like i've i've you know clocked the game because i think that's dangerous is it is it the case i mean i can Let's say, like I, it, I don't know enough about boxing to to uh, make predictions, but mm. it seems to me that you are truly world class and are on a path to become world champion. If or when you get there, then do you have to reframe and say, okay, but I want to defend my my belt for five years, or is is it is it like reframing the goal? Like how if you if you reach world champion in your mind, what is then the next step to keep impressing yourself and keep impressing the people that support you? I have no idea, Marcus. I have Get no idea. <laughs> I have no idea. No, so, you, you know that, that that plan that I told you about, uh, Commonwealth Games, Olympics, world champion. I made those I made those plans when I was 14 years old. I like I, that's, that's half my lifetime ago. I've been boxing for half my life now. Uh, and that was, those were three... Uh, three milestones that I am on my way to achieving. Uh, like you know, I I, I might have missed the last one, but I'm like, I'm 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 happy I, I won a medal because I deserved it and I worked my ass off to get there. Um, and I'm happy with I'm happy to close that chapter. Um, the Olympics uh was a springboard for me to uh project myself into the into the professional boxing uh, scene and that yeah that 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 kind of is like um my 14 year old brain was well that's that's the end that's the destination but um 
the destination uh is such a lie man it's such a lie uh like you you could you could win um you could win everything uh that's available but you won't necessarily find happiness through that you know and i'm i'm under no illusion i've like um i have i've i've won enough that i realize and i've okay i've been to enough countries to realize that home is where your heart is home is where your heart is i've, I've been to 30 countries now and there are maybe two or three countries that i could live i like i that that i could that i could call home um but it means nothing if your heart isn't in it you know um yeah. so i've i've i'm happy with where i've been i'm at a i'm uh I, I heard this really. Uh, is this too philosophical for you? Because I'm like, I'm Hell really, no. en- I'm really enjoying it. Okay, cool. Hell no. The, my, I, this is awesome. this is why I love these chats. Let's go, man. Okay, so <laughs> my my uncle my uncle um, uh, would call me uh, un, um, you know, like out of the blue, and he'd ask me kind of open ended questions that um, I would kind of just entertain and be like, oh, okay, well, like. Um, you know, they're open to interpretation. And so he asked me, he says, what does the, um, what does the horizon look like to you? And I was like, oh, you fucking... <laughs> all right. I was like, well, um, the horizon is what you see when you're sailing a ship. I can't sail. So I'm looking out at the horizon. Um, you can't see what's on the horizon. You can't see the horizon. You can only look at it from afar. So if you're sailing out towards the horizon, you're going to keep sailing uh, until the story ends. Okay. But along the way you will find, uh, you'll find shore, you'll find land. So for me, uh, there are destinations along the way, along the journey, the, the horizon is the journey, but along the way you'll come across these, these islands. And so when you, when you, uh, when you reach one of your, your milestones, these are milestones. When you reach one of these islands, you uh you you put your anchor down and you get off uh you you get on you co- get onto land with whoever's on the ship with you so you look around at the people that are with you and you say um i either i like these people and i like they're here for me and with me uh to help me and we help each other or you might think ah oh, that guy needs to walk the fucking plank you know <laughs> that guy that guy needs to go okay and so you can also look around, you can look around and say, um, uh, like, what do I need? Uh, what do I need here? Uh, to, in order to keep traveling on my, on my, on my journey. What, what, once, you know, when I get back on my way, you look around and you think, ah, oh, I've got, um, it's a beautiful island. There are like, uh, bananas, mangoes, there's everything you need. There's, um, uh, you know, there's, there's happiness, there's, there's good vibes, whatever. So the destinations, the destinations are along the way. But we're all heading out towards the horizon. Um, so when we set out again, we make a decision: Are we with the right people? Have we uh, have we got the right support? Are we, like, do we like how this feels? Do it, like is this is this a, is this an okay? Is this a safe place? Uh, and if it isn't, then you've got some work to do. But if if it is, you need to uh, get what you need and keep moving forwards. Because like, if if we if we stop if we stop and sit too long, um, you know, we'll stop evolving and we'll stop, stop growing as people. So like, I think I truly believe we need to take those, um, uh, those special people on the journey with us in order to, um, to be fulfilled. Uh, that's, it's really important. I, I love this metaphor mm. and I'd never heard it before. I made it up, dude. That's why. That's Dave Logic, is it? <laughs> That's Dave Logic, man. <laughs> I start my own podcast. I got a, I got an Instagram and everything. I haven't posted anything. Nice. <laughs> no, I, I really love it. That one, one bit of pushback. And this is so. I feel like I'm very similar to you in that I find a lot of joy in pushing, in striving for things, doing the work, like seeing the progress, and just in that process, I find a lot of joy. And what I think my wife would say is, but are you, are you, are you present? Like if you're always looking towards the horizon, how can you appreciate what's around you right now? And I'm curious to hear what your take on that would be. Like where, 
where is the balance in, in your mind is it if you have the right people on the boat then that's the balance or like how do you appreciate the here and now when you're always looking towards the horizon um so that yeah so that uh for me it sounds like maybe you didn't you didn't um you didn't stop at the island you didn't stop you didn't get off you didn't uh enjoy enjoy the spoils of um you know what you've achieved so uh after the olympics bronze medal epic enjoy it uh look around you see who's with you um enjoy it with those people and once you've once you've uh you know once you've um soaked in everything you can from that experience you're ready to go again you've uh, like uh i'd like to think that you were able to actually enjoy that triumph and move on move forwards because like but we don't we 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 might like i thought my my destination was five years ago you know like i thought i was going to go to the rio olympics and win a gold medal that was never that was never the universe's plan the universe never wanted me to do that the universe wanted me to grow uh i i had so much more maturing to do over that those five years and uh none of it was easy none of it was easy and and it just made that next uh milestone that much sweeter you know it's five mm. years five years is a long time and i'm i'm not a, a patient person i don't have a, like a hell of a lot of um time for um you know, like, like i said like right at the start of the podcast my brother would get carried away with these tiny tiny little details and i'd be like not for me let's let's yeah. let's move on the only thing i've ever been able to stick to is boxing um and uh that's partly why i owe so much to the sport um because it's do- done so much for me you know um and if uh, cool. I'd, I'd be doing a discredit to myself if i didn't if i quit if i if i said oh you know what this is um boring boring had enough right. next you know next next right. Next, uh, next hobby. Cause I've got a lot of hobbies, man. <laughs> Dumb ones too. Nah, they're not, nah, they're fine. <laughs> we, we should absolutely get into some of your hobbies, but for, before I forget, yeah. uh, I'd, I'd really like to drill down a little bit into this paradox that I see of, you know, you were speaking a little bit earlier about, um, never getting into a confrontation or an altercation out of the ring. You're known as the nice guy. Uh, in a previous podcast, you've you've said that you like to live by the the adage of smile and be nice. Mm. And I remember actually asking you a little bit about this in Tokyo, like asking, do you have to get yourself angry before a fight? Mm. And and your answer then surprised me. But do you mind just explaining a, a little bit how how you can be a nice guy and still win as a professional fighter so much? Yeah, I um, I've the times I've got angry in the ring have been some of my like. Uh, like I look back and think, ah, oh, that was a mistake. That was a mistake. Getting angry mm. then was a mistake. Uh, more times than not, uh, like every time, every time I got mad in the ring, it was like all of a sudden it, it took a little bit out of me. It took, it took a little bit of energy out of me because, um, because I tensed up and I, I, you know, I, uh, like you were saying before being loose and relaxed is so important in, in a sport like tennis and boxing. Um, mm-hmm. because if you're, if you're wound up, especially in, in professional boxing, you can't spend six rounds wound up cause you've got another six rounds to go. Um, that makes a lot of sense. It, it, it can take so much wind out your sails. So, um, I've, I've never, I've never had a mean bone in my body. I, and like, I'm not going to grow a new finger or a new thumb. So, um, I, I, I'm pretty happy with who I am as a, as a person and as a fighter, I don't need, I've, I've already proven that I don't need to be angry to, to achieve, uh, at, at, you know, being a world-class athlete. So for me, it's, um, it's always been pretty, pretty simple, pretty straightforward. Um, I've got, uh, I've got a task, uh, and I'm going to like have a, you know, like I'll, I'll shake the man's hand afterwards, and we'll like I'd love, I'd love to go out and have a beer with the guys I fight because it's like you know it's, it's fun. This you shared like, something. So yeah, yeah, you share something. You like you don't get that anywhere else in any other sport, you know, um, because it is such a relief. And you, you're, you're, I'd like to think like as long as everybody gets home safe, that you're both, you know, better, 
happier healthier people because of it you know yeah. um and in professional boxing you know all of a sudden you're providing you're providing for for a family you're um it's a it's a means to to a, a, a brighter future yeah and perhaps a great example of you holding your your head uh is in the olympic round of 16 a lot of a lot of media attention after your opponent tried to bite your ear and mm. you know we can all recall the the tyson moment and the furor around all that uh but speaking to you in, in tokyo about it afterwards you basically just laughed it off i mean talk about a demonstration of uh it being better to to not get angry in that situation how do you think about that incident now that you've you've had a bit of distance from it um I don't think about it to be honest. I've completely forgotten about it. But <laughs> it, it would have been a lot different if he actually got you know got a good handle on my ear. <laughs> I'd, probably, I'd probably have more to say about it. But um, no, he. Um, There's uh, the modelling I, career gone. Yeah, yeah. I um, I I I I understood how he was feeling because I was like, I'm kicking your ass. Like I, <laughs> I'd be I'd be pretty pissed off as well, you know. Um, but no, that, like uh, someone tries to bite you, it's like it's like ah, I've won. I've won. You're in the like, head. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm well. I'm well, well on top of this guy, you know. Um, so I, I, I kind of, I was like, oh man, I've really demoralized him to the point where he couldn't even uh, behave professionally. So um, that's such a great take. Yeah, yeah, and like, um, I was already kicking his ass. So what am I going to do? Like, kick his ass more? I was like, <laughs> like I don't know. yeah. Did he? Did he ever apologize or like? acknowledge it with you like did you talk about it with him uh he messaged me on instagram to say sorry um and That's i like something. i yeah because i felt bad because he was getting um he's getting some really bad kind of press um about it and i i think i just addressed it on social media saying like it is what it is but don't like you don't need to like send him send a man death threats you know he just had a he had a lapse in uh concentration and like a lapse in um you know uh, what's the word? He just he got angry. Like he got so angry. Red and, yeah. yeah, he got angry. Like and and we're already in a fight. Like what's you know like, um, what's 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 biting me? It's like it's, we're already in a fight. It's fine. <laughs> um, and it, and he was gonna <laughs> lose a point for it, you know, or like I don't know. I wasn't too hurt by it. That's, that's a great yeah, take. Like I, like I said, if he got my ear, it'd be it'd be a different story. <laughs> so you have spent some time in the UK training alongside fellow Kiwi boxer, former world heavyweight champ, Joe Parker, mm. also uh, based at Tyson Fury's base, I think, who, mm. who doesn't really need any introduction. Mm. What, what did you learn from those guys? What, what did they do differently that has made them the best in the world, if anything? Um, it's more of a mentality than anything. Uh, and it was, it was a bit of a shock to the system, uh, the way they approach uh the sport is it's a fight it's not a competition and i've always kind of uh spending you know 13 years in the on the amateur boxing scene it always felt like a competition it always felt like um a sport I had to, rather than a fight yeah yeah i had to compete against another guy i had to hit a guy more times than he hit me but now uh spending time with the uh with the furies with joseph parker i realized i was like oh this is a fight this is two men beating the snot out of each other um and someone's gonna get hurt uh that's that's the aim of the game it's re it really is like uh modern day gladiators i can't and that that's i like i I've I've grown up. I'm grown up now. I'm 28 years old. I'm very aware of my mortality. I know I'm gonna die one day. You know, when I was 14, I was like, man, like I'm getting this respect. I'm getting respect from like the big uh, first 15 rugby players when I'm 45 kilos, and um, people are respecting me because I fight. I'm like, oh, this is kind of this is kind of weird, but now I'm realizing oh, this actually is really dangerous. <laughs> this is so dangerous. And like um, uh, the, the gloves, the professional boxing gloves are designed to protect your hands, not your opponent's face. Amateur mm. gloves are completely different. You've probably got about that much padding that's about two or three inches in front of your knuckles to stop the, your opponent getting knocked out. As opposed to professional boxing gloves, you might have uh, a centimeter of horse hair between two layers of leather. That's not much, man. That's not much. It's going to protect your hand, but it's going to really, really hurt someone's face, you know? Um, and 
at 12 rounds there's there's the added um danger of dehydration exhaustion uh heat you know like there's so many factors that can uh cause you to get really really hurt um and i'm like uh i'm i'm smart enough i'm wise enough to to you know use my uh use my head like not phys- not literally but like i, I can I, I can use my head figuratively to to outsmart someone i don't want to use i don't want to put my brain at stake if i don't have to um and so i'm i'm just i'm just developing into a more refined athlete but it's it's taken a lot of kind of unraveling and unwinding to to kind of get back to probably a more um natural uh style and kind of way of training uh, i'm i'm naturally a slow to twi- i'm a slow twitch athlete so i'm i'm f- i'm fit i i'm better over like long distances uh but over three three minute rounds i became uh, like a, a, a like a high impact athlete a high uh, <laughs> i i became nice. I, I became a, a, like a a, a, a a really fast twitch machine because i had to be able to like do as much damage over nine minutes as possible mm. um but now it's like okay you've it's we're, we're running a marathon now that's what we're doing do you do you think you could successfully take the boxing as a sport mentality into professional boxing no no see I, that's the thing i've i've had to i've had to drop um a few things like i've had to become uh a lot more patient the way i train the way i uh the way i just the, just yeah just just the way i think about boxing because I, when i when i would train myself i would try get my training done as quick as possible because a i wasn't enjoying it b i didn't have anyone else to kind of uh push me along and i i just felt like i was trying to rush everything now i have to like be a little bit more patient i have to um you know be in it for the long run and is do you ever get worried about the toll that boxing could take on your body on your brain if you know you get you get punched enough times in the head or you know that sort of stuff i remember hearing you on one podcast saying that you think you're you're going to be a physical wreck by the age of 40 i totally understand where you're coming from i sort of feel the same but like (laughs) but like the I guess first, does that scare you? And second, uh, does it feel like it's a worthwhile trait? Uh, it's like, what do you mean as a worthwhile trait? Putting trade off a, meaning like a trade, a trade off. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, it's a hundred percent. Like I'm the first major injury I had and it was, it was, it was a minor major injury. I've got like a bad back. I had like a, uh, disc bulge and i was like man i've i've never not been able to uh you know change my underwear before that i've never i've never experienced that i was like i was in so much pain uh and i was like wow this is okay this is when i started getting through rehab i was like oh this is something that i'm gonna i'm gonna live with and that was about six years ago and i I was still first thing i do when i uh when i start training is i have to like limber up my back um and that's it's just part of my life now and i i i intend i I, i'm i'm assuming that that's probably something that i will have to deal with uh forever like as a as an athlete or as an ex-athlete when i when i have retired i think there are going to be so many things that i have to uh keep addressing every day to to maintain maintain a healthy healthy lifestyle one one bit of brightness that I might be able to add is so I've been off tour for about 20 months now and for the wrong reason like I've had a couple of knee surgeries Mm. but I will say maybe three or four months of not being on tour and so many of the niggles that I I just took for granted as being part of my daily existence like Mm. probably actually at a similar age to you like early 20s I herniated a disc in my back and have Mm. had to manage that forever and they start to fade away well, they mm. did for me anyway, which mm. was, it was weird, actually. It mm. was weird to to wake up and sort of not have this pain that you had to address just yeah. to sort of get going. That's badass. I think I think there's, there's also, I think there is also uh, some kind of benefit to um, 
some of those some of those niggles so like learning learning how much your body needs to move uh in order to stay happy and stay stay healthy yeah. is really important and a lot of people probably don't get that they're like man i just i just i have shoulder pain i have back pain i have yeah. uh, i have bad knees it's like you don't move you don't move you need to move man like um yeah. uh, the reason you're you're sore and miserable is because you've never you know stressed yourself out for like i don't know I, I just feel like there's so much to exercise that people probably don't appreciate if they haven't done it before um so many like kind of physiological benefits there's so many um like Hormonal like benefits. If, yeah 100 percent. if i stopped training if i stopped trying to fix my back my back would still be cooked and i i know much younger younger guys and gals today that are suffering with uh injuries and they're never going to get better because they don't have the they don't have the means or the expertise around them to to fix it and it's like it's it's sad it's sad and that like they they kind of think ah oh, well bad back that's me done you know yeah. like if if we if we settled for our, our herniated discs uh chances are we wouldn't be athletes anymore we'd be would probably be sitting down like this somewhere, somewhere making really, really, worse. really unhappy, making our backs worse. Exactly. Yeah. No, not, it's not, not the light. It's not the way. Hey, two more questions on boxing. I'm aware yeah. we've already been chatting for ages. No, it's, uh, good, it's been amazing. Um, first one is, so I'd just like to understand a little bit better the, the pathway of pro boxing because me too, as I said earlier, <laughs> Say again. <laughs> Me too. I don't. Yeah. I don't really get it. Because <laughs> oh. like you're obviously you're obviously truly world class. You know, two com games, golds, an Olympic bronze, and it seems to me that you're not yet getting the fights where you can actually prove that. So I'm I'm just curious how you start getting those fights. Yeah, that's um, that kind of goes hand in hand with that idea that uh, professional boxing is very different. Um, it's a very, very different sport, and that activity that I was talking about, uh, just getting time in the ring under the lights is so important because I I feel very, very different uh, in a, a professional boxing arena um, because all of a sudden it's like, um, it's not it's it, it's the, the way the way this shows are run are different. Uh, the we weigh in the day before. It's more lights, camera, action. You know, it's um. Mm a lot more that goes into it, but also developing into a, a, a fully fledged professional cruiserweight that like, you can't just go in and fight 12 rounds and some guys do it. Some guys do do it. Uh, the Lomachenko's of, of, of today, they will go ahead and put themselves, uh, like, I guess they're, 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 they're chasing greatness. You know, they're, they're going to go and take a, a 12 round fight in their second or third uh, professional belt that's great but that's uh that is not my my journey not my pathway i i've actually i've put so much work into becoming a a, a fast twitch athlete um and uh in my earlier amateur days that i have to go ahead and unstring all that i have to become a, a, a slow twitch athlete again because um i have to 12 fight. rounds 12 rounds is a, is a long way and at the moment I'd, I'd say i'm probably a six to eight round fighter right now realistically um i'm i'm under no illusion uh of what i'm capable of um but right now i'm a six to eight round fighter um and that doesn't mean to say i couldn't beat uh guys over 12 rounds because you know you don't get paid overtime you might get a knockout but that's um it's a it's a really fine balance between getting uh, activity and then getting the tests and getting the harder fights and um, learning learning about how you operate in the ring. And I, I really, I want to do this right. I want to do this right. Mm. And I only have one chance to, to, uh, to, to, do, it right. to do it right. And um, I've seen too many athletes go the wrong way about it and uh, their, their career falls over on the first hurdle, you know? Um, yeah. So I I I I think that I, I've I, I'm taking the I'm taking the right approach for myself, um, and I'll continue listening to uh, my advisors like Noel. Noel's like one of the most knowledgeable guys uh, when it comes to to boxing and the the development of professional boxers. Um, cool. So I'm yeah I feel like I'm in a really really good place to to keep 
keep striving forwards. We've got another another date in just under two months that we're we're looking at um, getting another nice. another local belt. So, um, nice. Yeah, I just want to keep getting in the ring as much as I can, and those those tests will come. Um, and we've we've still got two dates, uh, almost one and a half locked in. I'm going nice. to say we're we're almost locked in for two more fights uh, before the end of the year. So um, that's that's the most important thing right now is getting activity and getting getting time in the ring. So I need I need uh, to to increase my opposition each time. Um, yeah. Cause, yeah, that like, makes a it, lot of sense. It'll be it, one of the problems is like what guys do is they'll take a really hard fight early in their career. They might win it, but then they haven't really learned as much as they could have if they had a few other fights before that. And you, once you go up, you can't come back down. Coming back down yeah. is like really hard because um, if if everyone's seen you beat the crap out of another world class fighter, they're gonna be like, oh well. I don't want to do it unless you're paying me a lot of money. And then all of a sudden yeah. you've got to pay for that guy's purse. Um, and he wants 50 grand and it's like, Oh, uh, uh. <laughs> I don't, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, yeah. I don't know. Let me check under the couch pillows, you know? <laughs> um, so yeah, it's Find uh, some of those stimmy checks. Yeah, exactly. But, um, yeah, there's, there's a lot more that goes into it than I was aware. And I, I'm, I'm a lot, I, I'm, me and Noel open book everything. So he, he takes me through the process of everything, um, of how the, like we're, we're putting shows together right now. We've, we've had a meeting with the ticketing company this morning, flick it. Um, and we're, I'm, I'm learning the ins and outs of, uh, production of management of everything. I'm learning everything about boxing. So when it's all said and done, cool. I could probably be a promoter myself if I really wanted cool. to be. That does make a lot of sense and, mm. and sort of thinking about it as a long-term process and not jumping ahead, especially mm. physically, that that makes a lot of sense. Mm. Mm. Um, last, last boxing question. What's your most memorable fight and why? Oh, good question. Um, hmm. I'm going to say probably my first... Uh, my first Commonwealth Games final, um, because I I remember I'd fought four times in the week leading up to the final, uh, and I remember uh, try, trying to warm up for the, my final, and I was like, I'm really sore. I don't, I think I'm just gonna go. I'm just gonna go in and do it if that's all right, guys. Uh, talking to the coaches that were in my corner, um, and I knew the guy that I'd fought had fought one less fight than me, so he'd had three fights, two of them. To, uh, two or three of them he won by knockout and so i was like oh he's fought like a, a, a quarter of a quarter of the rounds that i have he's fresh he's fresh and i was like oh it's so stale i was so i was so <laughs> brittle but um it was uh that was really tough and i remember coming out to the crowd and i was like oh okay i've, I've got to turn on because i think there were like twelve thousand people and probably Damn. the biggest the biggest crowd i'd fought in front of was maybe like three or four hundred and it was just uh, angry boxing people whereas this was like you know so we're in we're in bloody glasgow and uh i've got like my family my, my my parents were there my uh the new zealand team was there and i was like wow i had rob Waddell came like came and like brought all the noise and i was like whoa i was like this is this is crazy man and um uh the fight was really really tough um but i basically uh i i think it was also memorable because i um everybody bloody booed for me at the end because i think they uh i was i that was the only fight that i was a favorite to win and that the guy i was fighting was from mauritius and um everyone wanted that him to win and i like i got booed and i was like oh mm. I was like, that was really sad it was really sad but i i, I did everything to deserve that win um but what it's, a roller it's coaster. one of those things yeah i oh dude you, you can find it on youtube now i cried like a baby on the podium Oh, oh man we'll, we'll definitely oh. put that in a snippet yeah. <laughs> no, <laughs> also was... just moment of appreciation for rob waddell what a legend of a human that dude is a legend he i tell you what he um he stayed for two at least two hours after my fight to take me through the drug testing protocols he bought he he was my he supervised me through the whole thing because he knew i was new to it i was 18 he comes in he's um helping me with everything he's like writing comments on everything that they could have done wrong and i was like i was like 
Rob, I haven't taken any drugs. I was like, <laughs> I was like Rob, just Rob, just chill. But he was he was so caring, and he wanted to make yeah. sure that I uh, had the best experience, uh, and was just like, I was like, hey, you know, you've got like another six, seven hundred athletes back at the village. <laughs> he spent like two or three hours just with me um, in a in a in a s- small small room with a like with the drug testing people and i was like oh wow what That's a amazing. dude he man. just goes above and beyond eh? yeah like yeah. i remember in in tokyo before the opening ceremony pretty small group of us because i think a lot of the athletes were um competing the next day yes but carrying you know he's got these huge rower hands carrying like four folding chairs in each hand yeah. and like setting them up for us every time we stop so we could all sit down just stuff like that like, such a g it doesn't get it doesn't get shouted out in the media because the media is not there, but he's, it's yeah. like, it's, it's authentic. It's deep. And he, he lives it. It's I really remember cool that. Uh, yeah. He, he lives by, lives by the kind of, um, uh, he just wants the best out of best out of each and every single one of us. Um, yeah. yeah, I like, um, I really appreciated having him there and he was, he was at all my fights as well. Every, whenever he wasn't there, he decided that he was a, a good, a good luck omen. He was a good omen for me. So he was like, <laughs> he was like, he made it his task. He was like, no, no, I have to, have to be at this. Otherwise, you know, who knows what could happen. That's like, awesome. Such an athlete. So, <laughs> superstitious yeah. bastard. today. Eh? <laughs> hey, um, I'd love to talk about some stuff outside the ring. Do you, do you need a bathroom break or anything? No, nah, man, I'm good. So do you need to go. No, no, I'm good. Cool. I'm good. Ripping. Okay, so let's let's talk about Gaddon. So you're based in Gaddon, small town in Queensland between Brisbane and Toowoomba. What was it that, that drew you there in the first place and, and what keeps you there? It's a funny story, yeah. Um, so I was training over with uh, the Furies and Joseph in Morecambe in the UK uh, and through Duco events who were running the uh, George Cambosis versus Devin Haney bout in Australia, uh, they said, "Oh, we might be able to get you on this on this fight card." And I was like, "That's massive! It's a world undisputed world title fight." I was like, "Yeah, yeah, I'd love to go over. I'd love to go and fight on that card." Uh, so, uh, David Higgins linked me up with a with a trainer named Noel Thornbury, uh, and I was intending to train there for four weeks prior to the to the fight night. Um, came over, got a bit of work in, and I was like. No, nothing really stuck nothing really stuck in the first four weeks but we i i was starting to understand some of the lingo you know you, you go to another train or another uh gym they've got different uh kind of uh dialects of communicating different ways of communicating and yeah. i i i was just starting to starting to click a little bit and noel said after my first fight i won but not i didn't i didn't i wasn't happy with my performance he said oh well there's another bout coming up in another couple months say and i was like oh yeah 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 i was like um i'll um i i initially intended to go there for four weeks and go straight back to the uk maybe maybe visit family but um i was like oh, okay no no um uh, I'll, I'll do this next fight and my family came over to watch the next fight and then uh by this point i was like oh okay no i'm this is starting to this is starting to make more and more sense the the, the way we were training the the kind of uh, the kind of intent behind the training was starting to make more sense. Mm-hmm. And um, I just realized that I was, I was in good company. I realized how much uh, Noel cared about not only uh, boxing, but about me. And he was, he was, mm-hmm. he became really invested in what I was doing. And uh, I trained with his, with his sons as soon as I got here that they both box um, Cassidy and Rube Thornberry. And so I was like, I was helping them out with like uh, just giving them advice and stuff. And they were, they were really enjoying it. Um, Noel's partner, Noel's wife, Jan uh, became like a second mother to me right away. And then, and then to put the chair on top, I met Lexi and Lexi is uh one of the best things that's ever happened to me. Uh, she's she's my girlfriend now. Uh, Lexi is Noel's daughter, and I was um really really skeptical initially because I was like I said I remember talking to my dad. I was like, um, Dad, I really like Lexi, and but it seems a little bit too good to be true. And I was like, Am I am I am I shitting where I'm sleeping? And he said, um. He said, honestly, like, um, 
you kind of just need to trust uh, the universe. You know, the universe has spoken and um, just just go with it and see. Because, like, my heart felt so content and so, um, you know, like, full. And I was like, I was getting, I had, it was one of those, it was like, like I was t- telling you before, I, I, it was the next, it was another milestone. It was another island. And I, 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 I got off, I got off and I was like, oh, wow. I was like, the thorn breeze. I was like, oh, um, my family's just across on that other island. I was like, oh, okay. Well, um, I really, really like where I am right now. Uh, I've got mm. good people. I've got the, I've got a, a, a small tight knit community now. Uh, everybody loves me here in Gatton. I feel so at home. Um, and you know, like, uh, my siblings are all coming over from New Zealand, uh, tomorrow just for like for, for a trip and we're all going to catch up. I was like, I'm close enough to home. I've got my, my heart is so invested, uh, here in this small little town called Gatton. And I like, um, I really feel like I can project, uh, my professional boxing career to its maximum effect from here, which is like so strange. Like I said before, I've been to so many countries. I've been all around the world, but uh, it's it's landed me in a in a in a small country town in Gatton. <laughs> Gatton, baby, That's I awesome. love it. It is awesome. I I, I read an article um, that was talking about how happy you are with your life situation there in Gatton, and the question that came up for me was, how important do you think your happiness is and life in general? Uh, in relation to your success in the ring uh it's it's everything if not if not almost it's like it i i really really i really rely heavily on my surroundings because i i'm a i'm a i'm a sponge to to whatever kind of energy i have around me i if i am with bad people I'll do bad things. I'll be a bad person. I like that. That's just the, that's the way I feel. If I'm if I'm with the wrong people, I won't do the right things. Um, but I'm with I'm with people that love me, uh, in a place that um, you know provides a lot of a lot of good vitamin D. I'm there's sun every day. I'm like I'm super comfortable. I can train. I've got no distractions. Um, I've got my girlfriend, I've got my coach, I've got, uh, Noel's sons and my brothers, like immediately we're, we're like, there's some of the best, best kids I know. Um, and Jan has become like a second mother to me and my mum's just across the ditch. So I'm like, uh, I feel so, so privileged to be where I am now, uh, that I, yeah, I, I wouldn't have it any other way right now. Um, I know that I'm exactly, exactly where I need to be, which is, I think which is really rare considering where I've been and um how difficult things have been for myself uh in terms of like you know my training setup um so I, I yeah I've, I'm just leaning into it I'm leaning into it and uh I feel like I'm going to you know get the most out of out of uh these years training here in Gatton Awesome have there been I mean this this is quite a nosy question but no, have, have there been any any tensions because of how close to home everything is no nothing at all nothing at all i've um it's so that, impressive it's really impressive yeah like, let me tell you me and lexi live in this this room that you see behind me is our entire household essentially there's a bathroom yeah. right there but we we spend um most of the day together she was calling me just before probably to see if i if she could come in but there's there's no other bedroom there's no other room like we 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 are we are here this is um we live in a one bedroom studio apartment we don't even have our own kitchen i do all of my i do all of my cooking on this bad boy no way i do all of my cooking in this and it's Epic. dude i'm so good at it I'm so good it's at it. It's one of those big electric fry pans, huh? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um but no, I've uh I've made it work and I'm like I now I'm looking at buying a house here in Gatton. Uh this awesome. is yeah, th- this is definitely where I'm going to um project my my professional boxing career from. Very cool. It's a, it's, a, it's it's a it's a real wonder how we've managed because we've been together for a year now uh, as of last week I think it was um it's a real wonder how we haven't torn each other's heads off but like it just goes to show how um 
how well we kind of fit together which is cool yeah. and then it's super impressive I, i'm yeah actually i'm <laughs> i like hanging out with her family more than she does i think <laughs> it's pretty funny so one uh i thought your podcast so your partner lexi has a podcast called talk sexy with lexi and i listened to your episode on there i thought it was hilarious and showed a side of you that i imagine a lot of people haven't probably haven't seen before i kind of remember um, what we said on that podcast yeah you said so much <laughs> so much. <laughs> I bet I did. Oh, dick. There was a lot of Dave logic. Yeah, but it yeah, was, yeah. I there were some laugh out loud moments <laughs> that I that I thought was hilarious. Um, went into your coffee love. I am also a bit of a a bit of a snob when it comes to coffee, mm. and I wondered if you could talk me through a perfect coffee, Dave style, one that you make. Mm. Um, I actually I I purchased an AeroPress. Uh, when I was in the UK, which is, um, I can show you right now. This bad I travel boy. with one everywhere I go. This bad boy. Those things oh, are epic, man. Eh? Shameless plug, but AeroPress, you guys have done it, man. Uh, you know, the guy who designed that was the guy who designed the Aerobi Frisbee. You're kidding. No Same dude. way. Just makes epic stuff. What a whack dude. I got to meet him. <laughs> you got to get him on the podcast, I reckon. <laughs> Do it. Shit. <laughs> No, um, yeah, that, that's that, that's my daily coffee. I can take that anywhere. I can take it anywhere and make a like make a beautiful beautiful coffee. But it comes down to the beans. You really need you yeah. need a good bean. Um, do you I'll, drink I'll, coffee black? Uh, I actually I do it with cream now. I do it with cream. It's like because um, I I fast through until about lunchtime, so it just gives me a little bit of fat um, to kind of like keep me going through through the morning. Um, nice. Have you ever tried coconut got, oil? Uh, I not necessarily alone in, in coffee, but it's like that shotgun shotgun coffee. Is it? Is it similar? Bulletproof. Bulletproof. Bullet, bulletproof uh, coffee. Yeah. Bulletproof. I think is that's M- cream. MCT butter and uh, coffee okay. or something like that. Yeah, I we'll never clue. Or maybe shotgun coffee is another iteration. I think I think the best coffee that I know of um, to to date um, is Rocket in Hamilton just behind jb hi-fi that's if that okay. uh, i i that they, they don't sponsor me or anything they're just bloody great man they're awesome uh, cool. but do you, you know go- sam dakin yes oh yes he started a coffee place it's bloody good yeah man. yeah oh man those guys are slow awesome. coffee yeah yeah, yeah. i am um, shout out sam shout out sam yeah i i've actually i've been talking to him and kind of getting uh, just like little insights here and there because that's that's kind of a dream of mine a pipe dream to to start a uh, like a coffee farm you know and I was like yeah. oh, I'd, lo- I'd love to love to like keep in touch with how he's going and how he's finding it and wh- where he's where he's having his um uh, you know his uh, his hurdles and stuff but yeah so I th- I think he's doing an awesome job like young athletes creating small businesses outside of their sport that is yeah. tough man that is tough because that takes so much time and energy like i oh i'm way too add to like allow myself that that kind <laughs> of um uh i can't i couldn't remove myself that far from from boxing how cool would it be if you were able to produce and supply epic ugandan coffee beans for sam that would be gangster. That would be so cool, man. Yeah. And you know yeah, what? Collab. Um, so you, you're you currently donating, donating to the Maximum Good Portfolio, mm. which which is basically just all of the, the charities that High Impact Athletes recommends. Mm. And I was looking this up because um, I was curious uh, which of the charities operated in Uganda. And mm. three of the charities in that portfolio run programs in Uganda and do a okay, huge man. amount of good. Wow. So I just wanted to let you know that your um That's awesome. your donations are actually really yeah. changing lives in, in Uganda, which is That's cool. very cool. I um I like I love the idea that uh there's so much you can do for um uh for poverty over in those third world countries at for such little money. You yeah. don't have to you don't have to throw an arm and a leg uh to in order to impact so many people's lives. Um whether it be like I couldn't believe some of the stats of how many young kids die of diarrhea every year, yeah. something like five hundred thousand. Yeah, five hundred thousand. The stats people. around diarrhea, the stats around malaria, around like vitamin A deficiency, just oh. really small, like specific problems that are so sol- solvable or preventable. 
Yeah, it's and it's it's something as uh, simple as like uh, putting a bit of chlorine in your water can like stop. Yeah. Like I know here we're talking like, oh chlorine in water. Oh, it, there's chlorine in all of our water. The, the tap water here is pretty crap, but like you just we need to put it. it. Yeah, at least you can drink it over yeah. like over in some of those um, th- like third world countries. They oh, that like they're dying because of the water they're drinking. You know. Yeah, yeah. It's some it's something. I'm going to get the stats wrong, but a, a staggering amount of people, I think it's something like 1.2 billion people still don't have regular access to safe drinking water. And it's just like, we don't think about it, right? We turn yeah. the tap on and, and water that you can drink comes out. But mm. for a large portion of the world, that's not the reality. And mm. it it is so cheap. Like with um, one of the charities that we support is called Evidence Actions, Programs for Safe Water. And for a dollar fifty, you can provide a person with clean drinking water for a year. Whoa. We we don't even really think Man. about a dollar fifty, and that's life changing nah. for someone. Like that's yeah, I get that's unreal. I get real fizzed up about this sort of yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. Well, the, the the cool thing is those stats. Those stats are so yeah. uh, it's beautiful. It's beautiful to look at and be like, you're kidding, you're kidding. There are so yeah. many um so many charities you could throw hundreds of dollars at today. And maybe ten dollars will reach uh, the actual, um, the actual charity. You know, the actual yeah. cause. Oh, the actual like, um, you know, the person actually you do actually some feed. good. Yeah, actually yeah. do good. So um, yeah. Oh, yeah, I think what you guys are doing is so cool, man. And um, yeah, I'd I'd like Thank you. I'd like to learn more about it, and I'd like to continue um, growing in that space because uh, we we as athletes do have um, we have our profiles that we can actually. Um, share with others what you know what good we can do um and uh, yeah, yeah. I, I encourage everybody else to to you know get behind um just being a better person man it's not it's not it's not hard it's not complicated it's just um uh extending a hand instead of um you know I don't know, just worrying not, about yourself worrying about yourself man exactly yeah yeah, yeah. We're, we're, we're so stuck in our own heads that you forget that everyone else is struggling you know yeah every every so often i love i love having a perspective shake up mm. and we have this um it was it was created by giving what we can but we we have a link to it on our website and it's the how rich am i calculator and basically you plug in mm. how much you earn in a year and where you live uh, and it tells you what percentile you are in the world. Yeah. And I was I was doing a talk in New Zealand a while back, and I plugged in the median income in New Zealand, which I think at the time was like forty mid forties, forty four thousand mm. New Zealand mm. dollars, something like that. And median income in New Zealand, you're the top three point five percent wealthiest in the world. Whoa. So just like a sh- like we're so lucky having lived the lives that we've lived and just for me recognizing that luck and recognizing the privilege i love the perspective it it gives me it's like okay yeah Yeah. of course i'm I'm really lucky and i should use this position of privilege and luck to try and lift some other people up out of it you know 100 percent, 100 percent, and yeah like you said it's so easy to do and like with um uh even with like limited uh you know limited means you can still yeah. do so much for for other people like one cup of coffee a month you do a huge amount of good yeah exactly exactly yeah. what so bit of a self-serving question i guess but mm. what was it that convinced you about high impact athletes as a an idea or a community like what was the thing that pushed you over the edge into wanting to be part of it um for me it was probably uh I'll put I'll put it into uh, like I can't remember what actually pushed me over the line back then, but since since starting, because um, I've always wanted to have some kind of foot in um, in like ch- some kind of charity work, some kind of uh, charitable activity or d- doing yeah, something. You've fostered a bunch of animals, right? Yeah. Like you've you've taken action on that. Yes. Yeah. Past, so, yeah, I, yeah. I have. So I've I've done fostering for the SPCA. I've uh, driven the the food van for for Vinnie's, um, and the 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 thing that kind of um, 
got me recently and it got me thinking was I, I went to apply to uh, to do volunteering at, um, I won't say like which charity here in Australia, but I, um, I applied and like I gave it, you know, it, there was a survey that you had to do to fill out, you know, what, uh, what your strengths are, what you want to be doing, uh, how you could be of service, like, um, you know, do you have any criminal convictions, whatever, like filling out the survey. And, um, I was like, man, boom, felt good about it. I was like, man, I can't wait to, can't wait to see, you know, what's, uh, like what they're going to offer to me. And I realized how limited, uh, how limited we are by following these larger charities uh, and kind of we're not doing much good. Like I, the, the only role there was, was working in the retail store. And I was like, Oh, I was like, right. I have, I have, like I said earlier in the podcast, I have so much untapped potential. Uh, and that's not just within my given sport my given field i like i have so much like love to give and i have like so much um time and i feel like i, I even have like experience now that i'd love to i'd love to share with other people but um if if i if i'm gonna spend two hours of my time every week uh giving back to to um you know uh a community that that needs help it's not going to be sitting in a retail store yeah. You know, um, and the, the idea of the high impact athletes, the, uh, the idea that, um, every charity has been, uh, what's the word that they've been like, um, vetted, evaluated. yeah, they've been vetted, they've been evaluated, you know, where the money's going, you know, the money isn't going into administration, you know, that you're not paying, uh, so someone to so, sit in a retail store. So, yeah. And, and so that someone else can, uh, you know, uh, like make, uh, I, I'm not even, sh I'm not even sure what the, what the, um, term is, but I feel like there are a lot of people making huge, huge amounts of money through these charities. And mm -hmm. I don't, I don't believe that the big charities are the ones that we should be doing the most for because, um, you know, I'd, I'd much rather see, uh, my, my $5, my $10, my $20 go, into someone else's hands that needs it more than, um, more than people running those charities. Yeah. You've, you've um, really hit the nail on the head. Cause, uh, in my mind anyway, our point of difference with high impact athletes through the charities that we recommend is that per dollar or per unit of resource, they are the most effective at what they do in the mm -hmm. world. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to give your dollars, you want them to do as much good as possible, right? Mm -hmm. Like you want, as little of those dollars to go to salaries that aren't mm. necessary. Yeah. And you want as much of your dollars to go towards helping the people that you actually want to try to help. Mm. Mm. Um, and and that, it's so important that the, the charities are transparent and, and cost effective and mm. analytical about what they do as well. Cause if mm. you don't analyze, you don't measure, then how do you know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You, you want, you want to know that, um, your, your money's going to the, into the, into the right hands. Yeah. Like that's, that's, it's simple. It's and like th what I loved about the SPCA was that, uh, you know, you could actually see the, you know, you could see the, the, the little puppies you get, you see them getting fat and you see that they, they, <laughs> you start teaching them how to be good dogs. You know, they can sit, they can wait within a few weeks. You've, you've got a product that you're like, ah, I'm proud of this. And yeah. now you can send it on to someone else with the food vans. Um, you're, you're spending time with the people at the end of the chain that actually need the help and um you know you you can feel uh you're physically delivering that stuff. yeah you're like literally you delivering a yeah. service um and i feel like there's so much more uh kind of pride that you can take from knowing exactly where those dollars are going uh, so yeah. i think what high impact athletes is doing for for the world um is is unprecedented and i think like uh the the more the more people that are aware of this sorry I might be getting a bit quiet the more people that are aware that you can make a bigger impact the better right well, that's that's what we need well really thank you for for being part of it like it's it's really cool um and you know not only do I appreciate appreciate it but the the world does you know mm through your donations, through you speaking out about this stuff, you're really making an impact. It's, mm. it's very cool. Um, 
We've been speaking for about two hours. Why don't we f- finish off with, with a round of quick fire? Yeah, man. Load me up. Sweet. Okay. If you had to give a TED talk for around 20 minutes on something that wasn't boxing, what would it be on? Something philosophical that I don't know anything about. Dave Logic and how Dave it Lo- It'll be Dave Logic, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, would, it, it would be centered around health and well-being, I think. Nice. <laughs> uh, what's humankind's biggest flaw? Ha <laughs> ha! Greed. Well, oh, I like Greed. that. What about, the, what about the best thing about humanity? Um, community. Lovely. Mm. What's the kindest thing that someone has ever done for you? Hmm. Um, gosh. That, oh man, that'll take me. That'll take me time, eh? Totally understand. I, I honestly, I, I honestly think that um, our partners put so much trust into us. Uh, I think that is probably one of the kindest things someone can do for you so it's the one of the kindest gestures so um knowing that you are responsible for someone is uh a gesture that pr- we probably take for granted you know like being uh feeling responsible for another human um is probably one of the one of the greatest gifts that we have that's beautiful mm. what are the three biggest qualities that define you um I'd like to say my honesty, my resilience, and um, probably my loyalty. Yeah. Did I say loyalty twice? No. Honesty, resilience, and loyalty. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. One that jumped into my head was work ethic. I've, yeah, you work your oh, ass off. I work hard. I don't. Th- I don't think I work any harder than anyone else. Um, or like I. I. I'd hate to think that I, um, I, like I, I know I know I push my body hard. I push my body to the point of breaking. But um, I know there are a lot of people out there training harder than I am, uh, and I keep striving to train harder. But that's that's not that's not something I like. Um, it's just like you you're probably talking about what you've seen on social media, and it's like that's not real. That's not real. I I do I work my ass off, but um, uh, not not, not in just, front of not for the camera. Not just social media. So the I've been doing a bit of training out of the velodrome and they have records up on the walls of people who have done the most mm. impressive athletic feats. Mm. And I don't know what to call that exercise, but it's basically you're doing it's like a push up position but your hands are on Oh, it's a bench bars. pull, isn't it? Yeah. No, 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 it's the one where you you uh you go oh, down push- to like a deep deep push up, like beyond push up hold. Push up yeah. hold. Yeah. Yeah, those are horrible. But you did, your record's like seven minutes something. Yeah, yeah. That, I will. Sean lied to me. He said he said if you can get seven minutes, I'll never make you do this exercise again. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I did eight minutes just to be like, all right, don't you dare. <laughs> and I still do it every week. Still, still have to do it every week. He's a liar. But the, the reason I know that you have an epic work ethic is because to be able to do that. That's not natural strength. That's built strength. Like, no mm. one could do that naturally. You need to mm. have worked your ass off to be able to do that. It's pretty sore, um, man. <laughs> I believe it. I, I, do, I do, like, one-minute holds, and they're, they're hard. Um, That's good, man. Anyway, um, who would you most like to see become a high-impact athlete? Man, I'd love to see you tap into, like... Uh, um, the UFC or the NBA or, um, so like somewhat so like one of who, who are the um who are the most well known athletes in the world like, uh, in New Zealand it was probably like Israel Adesanya, he'd be a he'd great be catch. He'd be a, he'd yeah. be a big one. Um, you've already got so many so many uh, top tier Kiwi athletes. Um. Oh man, internationally, that's a great yeah, NBA is big, game. Eh? Yeah, like yeah, the yeah. Steph Curry's and the LeBron James's. Yeah, come on, man, come on, yeah, aim, aim for the, aim for the, for the freaking roof, man. <laughs> go, yeah, let's go, Steph Curry. Okay, done. Um, last question. This has been epic. Uh, how do people follow you and your career, and 
give us a, a little taste of, of what's coming up if you can um yeah i've uh i'm on socials i think i'm i'm on instagram facebook tiktok i don't really facebook or tiktok i i do actually i do but like um i don't pay i tell you what i don't want to sell, sell my soul to it my my soul is oh i get t- i get too you bloody take distracted as much as you let it take. yeah i'm not a consumer i i do not consume on tiktok or on facebook because they're, they're strange places i um yeah. Uh, where else? No, no, that's pretty much it. I think, um, I have a fight coming up on the 3rd of November here in Gatton and we're looking at, get, uh, getting some kind of streaming service, uh, involved. So you'll have to, uh, stay tuned for that. But, um, these shows here in Gatton get absolutely mental. It's like, <laughs> they are so good, man. Uh, that the kind of environment you can, uh, pack into a small space here is, is nuts um so yeah if, if anyone gets the chance to come out here uh y- you'll have a you'll have a good time it's so fun man awesome dave thanks so much for chatting man this is easily going to be the longest episode that that we've released to date uh i had a blast thank you so much for doing good in the world for being an amazing role model for people to look up to not just in boxing but across the board uh, just for being a good human and yeah thanks again for coming coming on the show really appreciate it no worries man love what you do bro keep it up